Welcome back to International Relations 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is why not proliferate? In this unit, we have seen plenty of good things happen to countries that develop nuclear weapons. And, well, less good things happen to the countries that don't. That being the case, it's a puzzle why we've only had 10 countries in the history of mankind develop nuclear weapons. I'm going to give you three explanations for that puzzle. Why not proliferate? Well, the threat of preventive war, the costs of proliferation, and good old-fashioned bribery. Let's start at the top with the threat of preventive war. Previously in International Relations 101, we've seen what happens when there is an exogenous power shift. That's a power shift that a country doesn't actually control. You can think about that as a long-term demographics shift. If one country has a fast-growing population, then it's going to be more powerful in the future vis-a-vis -a, -vis a country that has a slower-growing population. What we saw in the bargaining model of war unit is that if a declining state, that's the country that's on the wrong side of the power shift, sees preventive war as being relatively cheap as compared to a relatively large power shift, which is going to be unfavorable to it, well, in those cases, the declining state prefers launching war. Costs aren't that much, and the power shift is really bad. Well, nuclear weapons don't exactly fit this mold of exogenous power shifts. They're more endogenous. Nuclear weapons don't grow on trees. If you want a nuclear weapon, you have to train nuclear scientists, you have to enrich some uranium, and you have to build a bomb. These are all active decisions. It's not a natural course of action. So we call such a power shift an endogenous power shift because it's an internal system. It's something that's being made inside the decision tree. Something interesting happens when we have endogenous power shifts as compared to exogenous power shifts. Imagine that a rising state is thinking about developing a nuclear weapon. And a declining state, if the rising state were to build, would prefer launching preventive war. Well, suddenly, the country that's developing these nuclear weapons has far less incentive to go through with it. If they try developing a weapon, they'll pay some large investment costs to get to that goal, and yet, before they can accomplish it, their opponent is going to bomb the living daylights out of them. That's not a smart decision. You're getting a war, and you're wasting your investment cost in developing these weapons. So, if a power shift, for example, nuclear proliferation, is both endogenous, it's an active choice, and visible to the opponents, and the opponent prefers launching preventive war to allowing a power shift to transpire, then a proliferator, the guy who's deciding whether to build these nuclear weapons or not, they can internalize the credible threat of preventive war from their opponent, and they're going to choose not to build so as to not waste that investment cost. And what's interesting here, from the perspective of the declining state, the declining state doesn't have to offer any concessions or carrots to its opponent. The stick, the threat of preventive war, is enough to convince the potential proliferator not to develop nuclear weapons. We can actually diagram what's going to be going on with the three different reasons why countries don't proliferate that I'm presenting in this lecture. In this case, with preventive war, we're essentially looking at a power shift that is too hot. The declining state sees how far that power shift is going to be, and it's relatively large compared to the costs of war, and so its threat to prevent is credible, and that convinces the potential rising state, that potential proliferator, not to develop the weapon. So that's the first explanation, the threat of preventive war. The second explanation is the cost of developing a nuclear weapon. Nuclear weapons are not free. This is a good moment to pause this lecture for a second. I want you to think about this for a moment. The United States was the first country to develop a nuclear weapon. We've had a program now for more than 70 years. I want you to think about all of the money that the United States has spent on nuclear weapons in its history. And I want you to think about during that same time period, what other things has the United States spent more money on? The United States government specifically, not any individual, but how many things other than nuclear weapons has the United States spent more money on? Go ahead and think that over for a second. And if you have an answer, go ahead and post it in the comments section below. And if you're ready to continue, I'll give you the answer. You would think that, well, nuclear weapons, eh, maybe they, they're pretty cheap. They're not as expensive as having a huge army. And so eh, lots and lots of things have been more costly to the United States government than the nuclear program. 
And that would actually not be very right. There are only two things that the United States has spent more money on during the nuclear era. That is conventional military spending and social security. Everything else that the United States has spent money on, every other program, the United States has spent less than the cumulative effect of the nuclear program. So despite the fact that you might think that nuclear weapons are cheap, it turns out that that's not the case. Now, that doesn't mean that countries aren't going to want to develop nuclear weapons. You can think of nuclear weapons or proliferation as an investment in the future. You pay a cost now, you don't get anything from it now, but in the future, when you do develop that nuclear weapon, you'll have additional coercive power, and you'll be able to get something out of that. But the problem here is that if the additional coercive power is relatively small to the costs that you're going to have to pay to build those nuclear weapons, then you can't even threaten credibly to develop those weapons. They're simply not worth the cost. And again, albeit for a very different reason, an opponent of a potential proliferator has no reason to offer concessions to convince such a state not to develop the nuclear weapon. Going back to our meter on the bottom, this is a situation where the power shift is too cold. The additional power is relatively small compared to the cost of developing a weapon. And so, once again, we have a country who is thinking about developing a nuclear weapon, ultimately choosing not to. Now, if you've read Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you might think that we have too hot, too cold. The middle section here has got to be just right. That's a situation where an opponent doesn't want to launch preventive war, but the potential proliferator finds the cost worth the investment. And in fact, even in these situations, we see a third reason why states might not want to develop nuclear weapons. Good old-fashioned bribery. Previously, in our bargaining models of war uh, lectures, we've talked about how developing more power allows you to get more concessions. When you have crisis bargaining negotiations, the settlements that you arrive on are commensurate with the balance of power. So a country that's more powerful gets more stuff. Now, that would seem to imply, as we had talked about in the previous slide, that countries should want to develop these nuclear weapons to get additional power and to be able to coercively threaten it. But imagine that you're an opponent of one of these potential proliferators. You know that if they develop a weapon, they're going to enter crisis bargaining negotiations with you, and they're going to be able to coerce more out of you. Nothing stops you from, before they develop nuclear weapons, just giving them those concessions straight off the bat. If you do that, the proliferator no longer has any incentive to build. They're getting concessions commensurate with the power that they would have if they developed a nuclear weapon. And there's an advantage for the opponent, too, the country that is opposite the potential proliferator. They don't have to deal with another nuclear country. That's beneficial for a variety of different reasons. And so it might be worth the cost of that bribe to convince the other country not to develop a nuclear weapon. Now, one thing that's interesting about this is that we've talked all unit about having nuclear weapons and what having nuclear weapons does. But the difference between the too cold region and the just right region suggests that the ability to develop nuclear weapons is just as important. If you don't have the ability to develop nuclear weapons, you're not going to get any concessions. But if you do have the ability to develop nuclear weapons, you will. So this is a growing branch of the nuclear weapons literature. There are a lot of efforts to measure what latent nuclear capacity looks like or the ability to develop a nuclear weapon. Here's actually a map of countries in 2001, ranging from the white countries, which are the least nuclear competent, to the darker blue countries or the purplish hue that are the more capable nuclear countries. So obviously the countries that actually have a realized nuclear weapon, they're the darker countries. Countries that are poorer, like what you see in Africa, are lighter on average. But then you see some other countries that are pretty dark as well, like Japan and Australia and Brazil. Those countries, while they don't have nuclear power uh, in terms of nuclear weapons, they do have nuclear power. But in terms of nuclear weapons, those are the countries that can most credibly threaten to develop weapons. And so what we would anticipate, given what we've seen on the previous slide, those countries are going to fare better in crisis bargaining than a country that is weaker and doesn't have the ability to develop those weapons. Another interesting thing to note is how much of a difference there is between countries that have high latent capacity and the number of countries that have actually developed nuclear weapons. So there are a lot of different ways of measuring this. Here's just one. The darker purplish line is the number of countries that could potentially develop a nuclear weapon if they tried hard enough. And the light blue country, or rather the light blue line, is the number of countries in any given year where they actually have nuclear weapons. And you can see that in the earlier part of this time frame, 
there was a small discrepancy, and that discrepancy has ballooned all the way until the, the new millennium here, past 2000, where there's now a very large discrepancy between the number of countries that probably could develop nuclear weapons that they really wanted to and countries that actually have them. And so these three mechanisms that I've talked about, the threat of preventive war, the costs of developing weapons, and the bribes that you can get instead of developing nuclear weapons, that helps account for the difference. Now, one last place to leave this here is in this slide on preventive war, I said what happens when we have a power shift that is endogenous and visible. So if you're developing a nuclear weapon, that's an active choice. But can the opponent, that declining state, actually see what's going on? Well, as it turns out, this is a big concern, especially recently among policymakers uh, dealing with international nuclear relations. And so we're going to talk more about that in this unit. Obviously, there are other explanations for why bargaining can fail and why countries develop nuclear weapons, but this is one that's particularly pressing in the last, say, 15 years or so. So we're going to focus on the visibility problem. If you can develop nuclear weapons covertly so nobody can see them, what happens then? How does a declining state respond if it's not sure if it's actually facing an opponent that's developing a nuclear weapon, or is it? We'll talk more about that in this unit. Hope you enjoyed this lecture, and hope to see you next time. Take care.